Welcome back to Bargaining in War. This lecture is on how increasing the cost for war can increase the probability of war occurring under certain circumstances. Think about what I just said for a moment. It should strike you as odd. If you increase the cost for war, you are making it directly less attractive. You would then think that states would be taking greater actions and being more careful to avoid fighting a war under those circumstances. And certainly a lot of theories of conflict agree with that sort of sentiment. Take economic interdependence as a prime example. Under economic interdependence, states that are trading together more often should be fighting wars less often. If you're trading, well, you're getting a benefit from that. And if you're fighting a war, it's hard to keep getting that benefit while the war is ongoing. So that trade value increases the opportunity cost for war, and conceivably we would expect states to fight less often. What we're going to see in this lecture is that, in fact, increasing the cost for war can do something a little bit strange to the peace premium, which will then drive a strange and bizarre and counterintuitive result where increasing the cost for war increases the probability of war occurring. To get to that, let's rewind a moment and review what we've learned about bargaining under uncertainty over costs. So you'll remember that when A does not know B's cost for war, whether it's high or low, the equilibrium demand is a function of A's prior belief Q, where Q is the probability that A thinks that B is the high cost type. Specifically, there's a critical cut point, CA plus CB over CA plus CB prime, where if A thinks that B is above that as a high cost type with that probability, it makes the risky demand that only the high cost type will accept and the low cost type will reject. In contrast, if Q is below that quantity, that's the same thing as saying that A thinks that B is sufficiently likely to be the low cost type and so it's better to make a safe demand that both the high and the low cost type will accept. Let's rewind now much further and go back to the beginning of this course when we were first learning about how we were writing down payoffs for war. We made a quick simplification back then that the cost for war could just be written as one value when in fact, it's implicitly two separate values. So for example, CB is not just a cost for war. It's technically a true cost for war, how many people will die, how many buildings will be destroyed, and so forth, divided by how much the actor values the stakes, that valuation VB. Because both the cost and the valuation are positive quantities, we just collapsed it in a single variable to make things a little bit simpler for ourselves. Well, that works fine, but there are some circumstances where you need to be a little bit more careful with that notation. So think about this. Imagine I wanted to take a comparative static on this game right here. We've done this once before with A's cost for war, and that makes a little bit of sense because A's cost for war, there's only one type of A. Here there are two types of B. There's a high cost type and a low cost type. And think about how we might motivate that. We might not know whether B has high or low costs because we don't know how B values the object at stake. We don't know if they care a lot about it or they don't care very much about it at all. And it makes sense that that sort of thing would be private information. How much you care about something is a personal characteristic. Unless we can see into the eyes of the leader and know exactly how much they value the good at stake, then that sort of thing is reasonably uncertain. And if we want to take a comparative static on what happens under those circumstances, what we really need to be doing is holding those beliefs about the VB values, how much B values the stake. We need to hold that constant and change the actual cost part instead. So let's go ahead and redo this game with those explicit cost values. So instead of having it as just CA and CB, we're going to be properly dividing by the valuations. We're going to solve for the game, which will end up being not very much work at all. And then once we have solved for it, we'll take a comparative static on it. So let's solve for it right now first. How are we going to do that? Well, let's first write down the game. The game is going to begin with nature 
drawing either a valuation, not a cost this time, but a valuation. And the valuation will either be high or low. So it can draw VB with probability Q, or it can draw VB prime with probability one minus Q. And as always, we have our prime values being larger than our non-prime values. So under the circumstance where nature is drawing VB prime, that is saying that B values the good a lot. And in the other case, without the prime with probability Q, B doesn't value the good as much. This is private information to B. B knows what's going on. A does not. A is in the dark. And in the dark, A will make a demand. Our good friend X between 0 and 1. Once again, B, who's fully informed, will see that demand and accept or reject. Bearing in mind here that if you have rejection, A's war payoff is now going to be fully listed as P minus CA over VA. The type with a low valuation will have a war payoff of 1 minus P minus CB over VB. And the type with the high valuation will have a war payoff of 1 minus P minus CB over VB prime. Okay. Well, the reason that we can solve for this very quickly is the fact that we've essentially already solved this game before. We have this cut point right here. All we've changed is the notation. We have set CA equal to CA over VA. We have set the high cost situation as CB over VB. And we set the low cost situation as CB over VB prime. Why is that? Well, think about when we have VB prime being larger than VB, then we're dividing by a larger number. And so the internalization of that cost is going to go down. Think about what happens if your valuation goes to infinity. If VB is approaching infinity, that makes the cost of war being divided by an exceptionally large number. So it's practically zero. In contrast, the type with a lower valuation, the VB type, isn't dividing by as much. So it has a higher cost for war. So if we take this cut point and we just substitute this notation, we have solved for the game already. We don't have to do any more work. And that'll be very helpful. Less work is better. So again, as a function of Q, the cut point is now CA over VA plus, let's see, we have a CB here. CB is now this quantity. CB over VB prime, the higher valuation type is paying the lower cost for war, divided by CA over VA plus CB over VB. We have that right here. Okay, so we have solved for the game now. It didn't take much effort at all, like I said. If Q is above this critical cut point, then we have the risky demand being made. And if Q is below that cut point, we have the safe demand being made. This is what's happening in the equilibrium of the game. Full stop. We're done there. The question that we want to address, though, is what happens when you increase the cost for war, specifically for B. Now, I understand that in a lot of mechanisms where we're changing the cost for war, for example, economic interdependence, that might affect both states' costs for war. That might affect A's cost for war as well as B's cost for war. And so you might wonder what's going to happen if both of those things are changing simultaneously. Well, that's something that we cover in the textbook in Chapter 7. So if you want to see more about that, you can read through the textbook to get that sort of information. What I'm going to be focusing on here, however, is just what happens when you increase CB. The reason for that is that I want to highlight what the mechanism is, what's going on, specifically what's going on with peace premiums. And that's entirely what's going on with B's cost for war and not going on with A's cost for war. All right, so if we're increasing the cost for war, our expectation without any sort of further intuition, if we're just taking the basic version of this. Well, increase the cost for war, that makes war look bad. We want to have war be fought less often as a consequence. What we might anticipate is that the cut point will therefore shift to the right so that there are more circumstances under which A is making the safe demand 
and fewer circumstances where A is making the risky demand, so therefore we get more peace. However, think about what's going on with the peace premium here. We have these war payoffs for the actors. Let's think about what's happening with those war payoffs. Well, the difference between them is the peace premium. So this is the peace premium here. This is the high valuation types payoff for war, and this is the low valuation types payoff for war. If you just distribute out the negative sign on the right side, you get minus one plus P, it's a P, plus CB over VB. And so what do we have? Well, the one cancels, the P's cancel, and so your peace premium is equal to CB over VB minus CB over VB prime. You can rewrite that as CB times one minus VB or one over VB, excuse me, over one over VB minus one over VB prime. I'll get that right. That's a lot of words. You'll notice that this is a positive value in here. Why is that? Because one over VB is greater than one over VB prime. You can see that because if you just multiply both sides, you get VB prime more is greater than VB. So this is a positive value. And as you increase CB, well, you're increasing that quantity. You're increasing the peace premium. So based off of what we've seen before, our logic and what we've learned about peace premiums previously, we might expect then that when you increase B's cost for war, because you're increasing that peace premium, you're going to make A not want to overpay for the peace as often. And so it is going to make the risky demand under a greater set of circumstances than it would have before. So if that's the case, then when we have our comparative static being conducted, we should be seeing this value shift downward. In other words, now putting this in terms of epsilons, if we take the current valuation and add a little bit of epsilon to that cost, I'm just copying over the cut point now and taking the comparative static on it by increasing every instance of CB by epsilon. That, that should be shifting it downward. So that quantity should be less than the original cut point was. So now this is just taking this quantity and putting it down here. Okay, well, now what we're going to be doing for the rest of this is verifying that this relationship is true. So that's gonna be a lot of arithmetic and we're just gonna to have to go through it step by step and be very careful and check things as we're doing it to make sure that we're not making any mistakes. Whenever you get fractions, usually the best thing to do is cross multiply them off and you'll notice that everything in the denominators on both sides are positive. So when we do that, we don't have to worry about flipping any sort of inequality here. So what I'm gonna do is take this and move it here and take this and move it here. So let's start with what's on the left side of the inequality. We have, I'm just gonna copy it down first before doing any sort of foiling. CA divided by VA plus CB plus epsilon over VB prime times the denominator here, which is CA over VA plus CB over VB is less than, now take the numerator on the right-hand side, CA over VA plus CB over VB prime, and then the denominator of the left-hand side, so CA over VA plus CB plus epsilon over VB. All right, looks good. So now what we need to do is super foil all of this and hopefully find that some things will cancel. You can sort of eyeball this right now that there's gonna be like a CA VA squared here and here and here and here on both sides. So some things clearly are going to cancel. So by doing this, we're not just doing it in vain. It appears that we will be making progress if we foil everything out.
So let's go ahead and do that now. Let's start with the left-hand side. So we have a CA and a VA on uh, each of those. So we're going to square both of them. Okay. Now let's do this part and this part. So we have CA, CB divided by VA, VB. Now we have to be careful here because we have a CB and an epsilon. So let's start off by doing the CB part first and then we'll shift over to the epsilon afterward. So we have a CB and a CA. So CA, CB, and we have to get the denominators right. So we have a VA and a VB prime. And then we have a CB and a CB. So plus CB squared. The denominators are going to be different though. We have a VB and a VB prime. Now let's do the epsilons. So we have an epsilon and a CA. CA times epsilon over VA, VB prime. And then we have an epsilon and a CB. So CB epsilon. We have to be very careful as we're doing all of this to make sure that we're transcribing everything correctly. We're not missing a prime or something like that. Because if we were to make that sort of error, there's no guarantee that what we're going to be getting at the end is ultimately right. Or we might be stuck in a situation where we can't progress with reducing it any further. And then we'll have no idea what's going on. Okay, so let's find out whether that's less than the right-hand side of the inequality. So we're going to have to do a lot of foiling now on this side. So we have, again, a CA and a VA on both of those. Excellent. We have a CA, and now we have to break up this part. So we have a CAVA and a CBVB. So that is CACB over VAVB. Then we have a CA and an epsilon over VAVB. Now let's get the CBs going here. We have a CA and a CB. Just want to get this as clear as possible and make sure that we're not messing up anything else. I'll draw my Bs right eventually. Uh, VA, so there's a VA there and a VB prime there. Okay, now we have this and this CB. So CB squared divided by VB, VB prime, and then a CB and an epsilon. So CB, epsilon, VB, VB prime. Okay, so we've multiplied everything out. Now we just need to figure out where we can go from here, what can cancel out. Well, fortunately, let's take a look. The first term on each is a CA squared divided by VA squared. So those things cancel. The second term is CACB divided by VAVB. Those are the same, they cancel. Excellent, making great progress here. If we look at the third term here and the fourth term here, we have a CACB divided by a VAVB prime. So those things cancel, great. Maybe the uh, fourth term here and the fifth term here, CB squared divided by VBVB prime, good. Those cancel. Is there anything else? Uh, well, yeah. Look at the last terms. We have a CB epsilon divided by VB, VB prime. So those cancel. So we're left with just two terms that don't immediately cancel, although it's going to be very quickly solved. So we have CA epsilon divided by VA, VB less than CA epsilon VA, VB. Well, you know, the denominators cancel out. The CAs cancel out. Oh no, the denominators don't cancel out. Ah, you gotta be careful about this, this is what I was saying. You gotta make sure you transcribe all your primes. There's a prime here. The denominators don't cancel out. The numerators cancel out. The VAs cancel out. What doesn't cancel out is this VB prime and this VB. They're both positive values, so we can divide everything without flipping any inequalities or worrying anything like that. And what we're left with is VB less than VB prime. And somewhere way up top, if we scroll back far enough, we see that that is in fact true. So what we have just proven then 
is that when you increase the value of B's cost, then you are increasing the circumstances where war is occurring. So by increasing CB by some epsilon amount, when you increase it by an epsilon amount, you're shifting the circumstances where B makes the risky demand to the left, which means you're expanding them. It's happening more often. And again, to recap what's going on with the intuition here is that the piece premium is expanding. And so even though B is paying a larger cost for war, the demand that A is making out of B, if it tries making a safe demand, a demand that's guaranteed to be accepted, it is overpaying the low valuation type by a larger amount as you increase that cost for war. And A becomes more reticent to do that, and so it instead chooses to make a risky demand more often, and as a result of that, war is occurring more often. Okay, so that wraps up this lecture. This is, again, just introducing you to the idea that increasing the cost for war can increase the circumstances where war occurs. But what we're going to be doing in the next lecture is exploring this a little bit further and doing something that we've never done before with corner solutions. We're going to see how a corner solution where one type has a negative value for war, the other type doesn't, how that corner solution varies in our theoretical expectation compared to what happens in the interior solution that we've been exploring so far. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope to see you next time. Take care.